Hi everyone and welcome to my Andario Flurry Guide for Season 5. Andario builds are all the rage right now. They are really powerful. You might have seen the Andario Barrage Rogue from Mippy, for example, on Max Roll. Or uh, the old Andario Puncture. You might have played that in Season 4. And this is another version of the existing Andario builds right now with Flurry. Flurry has been buffed to have a lot more Lucky Hit chance lately. And is actually a pretty good carrier for this Lucky Hit effect on the helm. So this entire build is based around the Adarios Visage, the Mythic Helmet. It is a very powerful item and we have lots of poison explosions to deal insane amounts of damage. So this is effectively uh, a little bit more of a scuffed, <laughs> slightly weaker Barrage and Darius build that we have here. It has all of the same synergies. In fact, I mostly just switched out the skill and um, yeah, like a few tweaks on the skill tree and like one or two aspects and it's mostly the same stuff so i took the, uh, the um, andario's guide here that we have on max roll from mippy and then started tweaking it for the purpose of playing flurry with it now what's the advantage of flurry well flurry can go really fast as you can see here just like sapping around because it has this built-in dash effect it's similar to shred now so this is really nice you can just fly around and especially for for example firing pits here that i can complete in as little as like 70 seconds or so on a really good run uh, sometimes like 80 90 seconds 100 maybe maximum it is extremely fast at doing this kind of content and i can even clear tier 8 horse with this and this is all on hardcore as well it's a fairly safe build fairly tanky setup that i have here so i want to show you what this is all about i have a planner again based on uh, mippy's original uh, dario uh, rogue that we have on max roll and then i started tweaking it towards the flurry variation for people that really like flurry it is probably the best version of Flurry that I can play. And if you really like the playstyle and the feel of Flurry, then this might be a build for you. I had a really good time with this. I've also respect my Rogue now to try out the um, Barrage version, which is stronger. Uh, so there's not really any doubt here. But with this damage output that it can build and all of the same synergies that you have for either the Barrage version or the Flurry version, for example, you could technically even play this with Penshot, I guess. Uh, so there are various forms of the Andaria Rogue and this is another one. So it is really fun to farm with this and I guess for the higher end pushing stuff I recommend the Barrage version anyway. But Tom and the bosses are no problem and uh, even like you know at least tier 7 hordes farming is fairly easy to do with rather low end setup even. So as soon as you get that helm you can go blast and there's another advantage here resource management is way easier on this build compared to Fox on the Barrage variant where you might be struggling a little bit maybe you don't have starter skies and here i was actually able to maintain the resources without starter skies in fact i found it a downside that actually removed it from the setup and instead i just had like an extra legendary ring here so it makes it much easier to maintain your cooldowns because you can have extra tempers available on your ring in general it just feels like a fun fast blasting build to play while we're at it i also want to showcase this guide here the andarius rogue build from mippy that we have here so most of the same stuff is used in the flurry version this is the barrage build that he has here but as i mentioned there's not really that many adjustments so if you want to read up on some of the details about you know for example the progression and why you do certain things then you can also go check out this uh, written article here so let's get into the planner here i have three different setups this is also similar to what ha maybe has made here in the actual guide and i have a starter variant mythics with the tier is might mostly and then also the max dps version so it's especially nice if you want to do a tier 8 hordes if you want to go pit push very high end and so on we include a bit of extra dps there and also do a switch here with our ultimates the main thing that you need to know is that andarios is all of the damage in this setup so your skills don't actually really matter all that matters is attacking fast and having lots of lucky hit in order to trigger this and then any kind of generic damage multipliers are included here in order to get the most out of this. So in this case, for example, we have only one rank in Flurry. It doesn't really matter if you have more because your Flurry will do 0.1% of the total damage. And the same goes for, for example, Poison Immunement. Only one rank, we don't invest into it. It is only there to give us some extra utility procs. In this case, for example, Eldritch Bounty, the uh, legendary Paragon node here that gives us extra 20% poison damage. This buff works for the Andarials but the poison imbument otherwise is not really that useful. So this is something to remember here. 
and everything is built around this proc with the Andarials. If you want to play a real flurry build where flurry is the carry, this is not it, as I had mentioned earlier. Also, for example, we have an item here like the Fist of Fate. This was buffed in Season 5. It is an incredibly good tool for this build. And there's also a really nice benefit here, which is that the unique effect doesn't actually work for non-skill effects. So this means that, for example, Andarius is just an item proc. It is actually not affected by the Fist of Fate uh, unique effect. So it doesn't matter what kind of range you have. And since this item has really large RNG when you try to farm it, for example, from Beast in the Ice, uh, you mostly look at the lucky hit chance here as your main priority. The other effect that also kind of matters here is the chance to apply random crowd control. This helps us a lot with just being more safe in AoE combat. And for the bosses, it helps a lot with the stagger because you can get slow, stun, freeze, immobilize, everything just from this item. And since we have very high attack speed and very high lucky hit, we will trigger this over and over if you have a decent roll on this. And you will stagger bosses in seconds. Even on like the second, the third stagger and so on, they will come pretty quickly. And stagger is kind of the key for rogues to kill bosses quickly. And this is no different on this setup. It has a lot of conditional damage multipliers that activate when you have a staggered boss. One of the big ones here is Frigid Finesse, for example, that's with enough ranks on the amulet. Uh, can be <laughs> almost double damage, basically, against a frozen target, including staggered bosses. We have stuff like the Noxious Ice here on the boots, that's 35%. You have stuff like the Retribution aspect, for example. So there's a bunch of these multipliers, and your damage is times 5, times 10 even, in some extreme cases, on most rogue builds when you stagger a boss. So Fist of Fate, number one priority, lucky hit chance, and number two, the apply the random crowd control so you can actually get a stagger. So you want to try to get a good mix of both of these. So try to farm up a good one of the, this uh, item and this will help you out. Another important tool is the Umber Crux. So I want to get into that a little bit. Number one, it has innovation ranks, which is actually pretty nice to sustain your resources. This is a momentum build. So we already have some extra energy regeneration. This is a tool to bug here, but it's uh, plus 30% total energy regeneration. So you just have nice passive uh, income there. And then you have innovation ranks here that gives us a lucky hit. To gain energy. Early on in the start of every end, we use the starlight aspect to solve all of our issues. This just immediately removes all of your worries about getting extra energy because this works with overhealing and Andarius provides ridiculous amounts of healings. It has this super high life on hit and this means that with every tick of your flurry attack, which actually hits everything around you four times, and then with every tick of the poison, which hits every target twice per second, you will get thousands, like even tens of thousands of life per second, basically instantly. Anything that doesn't one-shot you, you will live, basically. This is how much healing you have. And this means that with Starlight Aspect, you have infinite amount of resources as well. But you don't really want to stick to this since you give up an extra power. And this is why in like the later progression steps, you will actually replace this with the retribution aspect I just mentioned. So it's just extra power. If you don't like this one, you can also put something like in you know, a column aspect, elements aspect, or there's a few choices here. But retribution is relatively strong. And since we have all these crowd control procs, or we can even temper a stun, for example, here, you will have this up pretty frequently. And even on bosses, since you mostly rely on the staggers, this will be active most of the time for the important nuke phases. So this is one thing here. And also the main difference compared to, for example, the uh, barrage and aerials that we have here, uh, this one runs with starter skies. Now, the thing is that Starless Guys is a pretty powerful item, and I tried it out with a flurry, and I noticed I actually had a problem. I was not spending enough resources. You want to spend a lot of resources on this build, and this is thanks to preparation and the combos that we do here with our ultimate skills. So number one, preparation. You want to use it every 10 seconds for a 15% damage reduction buff. And number two, we have the Paragon board, No Witnesses, which is uh, pretty heavily buffed in Season 5. A lot of rogue builds use this, including this one, which again gives us a 10 second buff on ultimate use. And this is, in this case, a 39% DPS increase. Uh, for those 10 seconds. So the goal is that you get your cooldown low enough that you can cast your ultimate every 10 seconds. With preparation, every time you spend 75 energy, you will get minus 5 on your ultimate cooldown. And since you attack very fast, you can actually get to the point where you have this 10 seconds buff active all the time. And this is why I don't have Starless Skies in a setup because I just noticed I have waited on cooldown. I actually needed something like maybe 15% or so in the best case scenario 
uh, 15 seconds when I was just constantly attacking. And also on the other hand, we have second wind here, a very powerful defensive passive. Again, when you spend 100 energy, you get this massive barrier. We have a bunch of extra ranks here, tempered on our pants, for example, plus we invest a few points. You can get your entire life pool as a barrier as well. And without the starter skies, I can actually trigger this often enough to have this permanently. And with starter skies, I was not able to. So I like the setup without Starter Skies a lot more because I have more frequent cooldown uses with the preparation. Preparation also resets everything else when we use our ultimate. So this is really nice. So it's just kind of like made a whole bit more fluid. Everything just worked better and we didn't have to farm another mythic item. So this is also useful for people that might not have Starter Skies available. This setup already has at least the Undarials and then later on the awesome materials. So that is probably a lot of farming for a lot of people already. Now, the other thing about Umber Crux that I actually wanted to get at, in addition to the innovation giving you this uh, energy proc that eventually allows you to remove the Starlight aspect for this extra offensive power. So again, if you have resource issues, go Starlight. And then at some point you can solve it with the mostly innovation ranks. You can also try to throw in a few more points here and try to fine tune it a little bit, depending on the exact setup. But uh, once you have your energy figured out, the Umber Crux is also just very useful because it gives you an additional target. So the totem itself and the damage it does doesn't really matter, but you can hit it and you can proc like a hits of it. And this means that in single target situations where Flurry is generally the weakest, you suddenly have double the damage because you have two targets and you can proc Andarials from the boss and from the totem at the same time. So this is why Umber Crux is so powerful in this. And we can trigger it easily with our poison trap, for example. So you just throw down the poison trap uh, with mouse and keyboard. It actually uh, spawns the totem on your cursor. You can actually spawn it in range. So we're going to be a bit careful where you put it. Mostly just like put it on the boss, basically. And otherwise, you know, whenever you are fighting infernal hordes, for example, just randomly throw poison traps everywhere. It also helps with, you know, some other modifiers that we have here, for example, in the paragons. So you always want to make sure you have a trap running, for example, for deadly ambush. This Paragon node here says that it increases your crit damage, which is actually untrue. It increases all of your damage. So this is bugged and is also a strong reason to run the Poison Trap and keep it active and everything. Lastly, another important change when you are already used to the Barrage Undario setup is that we need a source of Vulnerable. Barrage has built-in Vulnerable, so we don't need anything. But in this case, you need a ring like this. So usually Dex life is just on both your rings. And in this case, you want one of those Lucky Hit Rolls for the Vulnerable uptime. This is a very easy, convenient way, and with the amount of lucky hits you have, you're gonna easily make everything vulnerable all the time after like you know half a second basically. So this kind of works pretty well. I tried it, so that, that was really nice. And otherwise, maybe like an attack speed ring like this is fine. Uh, you don't really need to like master work it up or so. You don't need like a perfect roll. You will hit the attack speed cap relatively easily uh, in the uh, gear category as long as you master work your undarius a bit. You see here. Triple Masterwork and Ariel is 66% attack speed. It starts with, I think, 30. So it's a pretty high base value. It's like uh, more than triple of a regular roll, basically. So it's pretty valuable trying to hit this at least double attack speed, I would say. On my Andariel, I didn't go for the triple, so I just went for double, and it was okay uh, because we have, you know, maybe an attack speed ring, and then you have a bunch from the Fist of Fate, and then, for example, an Advantage Elixir, and you will get uh, close to the 100% attack speed cap in Cap 1. And we also have a bunch of cap 2 attack speed. Now, what this means exactly might elude some people. So just a short TLDR here. You want to get roughly 100% attack speed from Andario, maybe a ring, the fists, and the advantage elixir. So those four things together should be 100%. And then you want uh, 5 on a chemical advantage if you can get that on your neck. Plus 3 points here on the tree. This gives you another 40% attack speed and a bunch of extra like a hit, which is very useful on this. And uh, if you cannot get 5 to economic advantage, it's relatively hard to get because you might maybe have a neck that doesn't have, uh, that, that doesn't have, have like this right masterwork, for example, and you can't really invest into it, or you just don't really have like the combo between those different passives. Of course, this is like a very high end item. Uh, just try to get like any economic advantage rank. So just one rank is actually fine to get another pretty decent breakpoint here. Once you start master working up and then you still get a bit of value out of it. So you can try to either kind of invest a lot, like here I have two master work crits or the five, five is a good number on the alchemical advantage or just kind of like any alchemical advantage on your neck. And other than that, good passives here, Fridge of Finesse, very powerful. And so this is the strongest passive you have on the rogue thanks to this 10% damage against Frozen per rank, that's pretty strong. Unstable elixirs, 
also pretty good passive. So you can also include some other stuff. So instead of unstable elixirs, you can also have something like exploit, malice, percent dexterity. There's a few options here that are fine for this, but this is kind of the optimal combo. Now for the rest of the gear, it is actually relatively straightforward gearing, especially once you have a Tyrius Might, you don't really care at all about armor or resistances anymore because this thing instantly solves your resistances. And then you just put skulls in all of the jewelry and you have one armor roll without any extra investment and that is actually just capping you. So it's very easy to get that. And then you just go for like, you know, dex, life, movement speed, maybe this one wolf thing here that I mentioned. And this is about it. All these like, you know, damage over time. If you have like, for example, a bow or like a crossbow. Uh, in fact, it should be a crossbow. Actually, I forgot to uh, save my planner earlier. I made this as a crossbow. I will fix this. But this should be a crossbow. It barely matters to be fair. But uh, this damage over time modifier here. So a lot of people ask me, like, is this weapon better or that weapon better? I have a 1 GA here, a 2 GA there. Do I really want to prioritize the damage over time that badly? The answer is actually no, because you have so much of this additive damage category in this build, thanks to the Dark Shroud Tempers. They are really strong. And we put the Dark Shroud Tempers on all of our offensive slots and you reach something like 3000 plus percent or so additive damage. So what you roll on your weapons here is not really all too relevant. There's like a slight difference, you know, like one or two percent DPS or something like that. But if you happen to get like a good 2GA Dex Life weapon and uh, then, you know, the last thing you, or you can't really, you know, choose or you can't really change it to damage over time or something like that, it doesn't really matter too much. This is optimal here, but it's ultimately a relatively minor difference. For the other tempers here, we have traps, arm faster and poison trap duration. It is also fairly minor, but you know, on the long fight, you can just sometimes have the poison trap taking longer and, you know, reduce the chances that it might fall off. That it's relatively whatever, to be fair. Uh, on the other hand though, on your amulets and your rings. So here there are some important tempers. Number one is the poison impure lasts for more casts. Uh, you just want kind of like any value of this and then master work it up a little bit. So plus three is totally fine. This gives you five charges. It makes it fairly easy to sustain permanent poison in view thanks to Bursting Venom's aspect that uh, allows you to trigger those poison pools and have permanent poison in view. Reason for that is uh, twofold. Number one, the uh, Eldritch Bounty Node, as I mentioned. So we get the 20% damage buff whenever we attack with an imbued skill. And the other reason is also that we have the uh, our chemist fortune here. This is another extra lucky hit effect and this works for non-physical damage only. So when you have an imbuement active, this will be a non-physical attack and then you get this benefit as well. And there's actually a third reason which is that Bursting Venoms for whatever reason also has a lucky hit chance and can actually trigger Undario's procs. So there's like an extra little bonus here. It's not really like just like killing everything on its own but here and there you get an extra pop so it's kind of nice. So again on the offensive slots we put the damage production or tempers. We have one poison imbued temper and then also you want the ultimate cooldown reduction or trap cooldown reduction. So you see this here, instead of like movement speed or something else, uh, we go for this. And this also helps us to just cast our trap more often. As I mentioned, you want to do it at least once every 10 seconds. And this means that with continuous attacking and the preparation procs, you will get to the point where you can actually sustain this 10 seconds buff all the time. So this is very nice. And there's also the uh, max DPS version. This is also not necessarily really more DPS, but maybe more optimized, let's say. Uh, you can go for the Shadow Clone. And the Shadow Clone is not here to deal any damage. The Shadow Clone does nothing. It doesn't proc like a hit either, if you have that question. Instead, it gives you a 5 seconds unstoppable buff, which is kind of cool. So this is really the only reason why you want to do this. In fact, actually, I put this one point there that's going to be useless. You just want the 5 seconds unstoppable there. If you can sustain this 10 seconds window with the no witness buff and the preparation buff, so Shadow Clone is fine, especially in Infernal Hordes. Sometimes there can be a lot of crowd controls going on. You can have, you know, Hellborns that freeze you, stun you, whatever. Or you can have these call spells with the cold attacks freezing you. So a bunch of stuff. And if you try to cast your ultimate every 10 seconds anyway, you have very high unstoppable uptime. And the other unstoppable is the Shadow Step. So here, this is something I also recommend to keep on your bar. Alternatively, for example, in this setup here, there's only one mobility skill. You could go with the dash, but I recommend, uh, especially for like Infernal Hordes, the Shadow Step is really nice. But on the other hand, you already like dash around quite a lot here. Uh, with the Flurry, the Flurry has the built-in dash. So this is just, you know, you can fly around everywhere. So the Shadow Step does kind of the same thing, just you can go for walls and these kind of things. And also, yeah, just applies like some DCC and so on. It's good for Stagger, for example. 
But if you really like it, you can also go with the dash. You just won't have the next unstoppable. If you have the Shadow Clone, though, you have pretty good uptime. So that's kind of the main difference here. And with the Shadow Clone, you also need a different temper. So you see this here, this is ultimate cooldown reduction. This is only available on the Necromancer. This is a resource Necromancer temper. If you have played Necromancer in Season 4, you'll likely have this. And then since all of the temper manuals carried over from last season, you can just make a level 1 Necro and temper this. This is what I have done. I have not actually played a Necro in Season 5. If you haven't played a Necro at all in Season 4 or Season 5 yet, then the only way to get this is to make a Necro and level it to, I don't know, 70 or so to have a realistic chance to get this temper manual. As I mentioned, the Shadow Clone is somewhat optional. In fact, makes it harder to sustain those uh, 10 seconds buff. So you can also just get away with the death trap and it's fine. For the Paragon board, I made this setup here. This is also largely based on what we had from Mippy, but I've been tweaking it a little bit to my liking to include maybe a bit more defense because I like that. You see here we have 44,000 life in the final version. This is with materials. This is with the Andaris healing. This is with the second wind barrier. So it's actually a fairly tanky setup to be fair. Even with only one defensive power, which is the Umbers here, which gives us our Dark Shrouds. So you just attack, you get Dark Shrouds. You don't need it on the bar. This is also a very frequently asked question. <laughs> yeah, this is spec for basically every single rogue build that is required in order to survive. And we always have the dark Umbers aspect here to trigger those Dark Shrouds. Now, for the Paragons, uh, it looks like this is a seven board setup. There's a lot of legendary notes that are really good here. So I'm just going to go through them real quick. No witness, as we mentioned. This is the 10 seconds buff. Then we have the cheap shot when you CC enemies around you or stagger boss, you get up to 25% damage buff. Eldritch Balancy, attack with an imbued skill, get a 20% damage buff. Exploit weakness, you want to hit multiple targets and then you get a up to 25% damage stacking buff. And we have the deadly ambush that says it only buffs your crit damage, but it actually buffs everything. So that's really cool. And for this, you need to have a trap active on the targets. That's why the poison trap is included here. Alternatively, it could go Caltrops, but Poison Trap is nice for these Poison builds. It does have this 15% damage effect. And if you're wondering, this works only as it says when enemies are standing inside the trap. This is not affected by traps. You can't just put down a trap, get them one take that goes for 10 seconds and they run away. You will not have this buff. They need to stand in it. So especially on a staggered boss, for example, if you see the bar filling up, you want to try to prepare the Poison Trap, put it down, and this also, for example, spawns the Umber Crux Totem. So you want to make, try to time this a little bit and then have this full buff active. Now, here for the Glyphs, we have uh, Canny. This is a non-physical damage buff. We have Fluidity. This is just uh, mostly for the agility damage buff here as well. Six seconds after using agility skill, you get 10% um, extra damage. The energy region at this point probably doesn't really matter that much. So just make sure that sometimes you use a Shadow Step. Then we have the Tracker Glyph, 40% longer poisons. Control Glyph, this is extra damage against Frozen and Stunt. And here we have the Bane Glyph, again, a big Poison Glyph. 15% chance to deal double damage. And all over the tree, we have a bunch of uh, good um, offensive and defensive nodes, mostly a bunch of life here and so on. So we try to pick up life wherever we can. And here on the No Witness boards, you want to pick up the ultimate skill damage. The ultimate doesn't actually do any damage, neither does the Shadow Clone nor the Death Trap. So that damage is irrelevant. This is all just for stacking up this No Witness buff here. So you need an ultimate skill damage bonus. And this is also why, for example, we have the diamonds in our weapons. They look pretty, but uh, usually this would be something like, for example, Amethyst. In this case, though, we want to try to stack up this buff here. We get nearly to the cap, which is a pretty significant damage modifier. Yeah, and the rest over here is just like some damage reduction from slow enemies, for example. And here's also some damage reduction from vulnerable. That we pick up some more life and this is basically the entire setup now there are some more variations that you can do with this and as i mentioned at the start there's barrage there's flurry there's pen shot you can do a lot of different things with the end aerials but this is the flurry rogue that i've been playing and it was really fun you can also like tweak this up a little bit more so for example if you're doing like a lot of like let's say health hides low end content and so on then you don't really need something like Noxious Eyes on your boots. You could have a second pair of boots or just imprint over it like a Ravager aspect, for example, or some kind of mobility aspect. If your movement speed is still fairly low early on before you get Tyrios, before you get your Masterworks and so on. So you may, might want to try to put like a mobility power there until we get maybe into the higher end content and do like the, you know, high pits or high like T7 plus Infernal Hordes. Then you definitely want to go less for the mobility and more for the overall damage output. So there's some tweaking you can do here, but overall, yeah, this is just like really solid and I think works under all circumstances, especially here at the Shadow Clone. I really like the unstoppable uptime, so uh, that is nice. 
And that also concludes this guide. So I hope you enjoyed this. So Flurry and Diary Rock was a ton of fun for me to experiment with. I hope that I could convey all the important information here in this setup. If you have any feedback, let me know. Otherwise, I will keep you guys posted with more guides in the future. So stay tuned for that. I have a bunch more stuff coming. I've been experimenting a lot on the Rogue lately. And of course, on the other classes as well. Also, Gamescom and expansion news is coming. So I'm quite excited for that. I'll keep you guys posted about that as well. Hope you liked this video and I'll see you guys next time.